Hi, my name is Sally Otto and I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia. I'm going to go over some of the latest projections from the BC COVID-19 modeling group. The modeling group has been coming together and meeting regularly over the last um, year and a bit to talk about the emerging science about COVID-19, what models are needed, what we could do to um, better understand this disease, and also how we can help um, guide policy decisions and project what's going to happen into the future. The perspective, it's a very broad and diverse group of people using different modeling approaches. And I, I'm going to share some of those different modeling approaches. And I think it kind of helps to, because there's so much uncertainty with this disease that we're tackling um, the data from different perspectives and getting different insights. And that can help us get a more um, holistic picture of what's going on. I should say that we're an independent group. We're um, independent of government and um, um, we're not paid to do this work, um, but we're doing it as, um, as a public service. So the main messages from, that I wanna share with you today are that BC has done a great job of bending down the epidemic curve, which was rising really steeply in February and March of this year due to the rise in variants of concern. Declines are now seen and um, substantial declines in most health authorities with Fraser Health Authority continuing to face the um, um, challenges with high levels of COVID-19 cases. Had we kept going with our activity levels seen in February and March, we would have seen skyrocketing numbers of cases, but we've bent the curve down and um, this is consistent with really having reduced the amount of transmission um, by about 30% or, or more across the province in um, since February and March. So our April um, perspective is, uh, is much sunnier because of this bending down of the curve. We don't know exactly what's caused the declining transmission levels, but it, it, we expect that it's a combination of our individual actions when news of the demand on hospital and ICUs, um, was really taxing our medical care system. I think that caused a lot more individuals to take better, uh, less risky behaviors. Vaccination campaigns have been rolled out in hotspots to try and tamp down transmission where we see the worst COVID-19 outbreaks. And of course, there were the restrictions uh, introduced in, on March 30th, um, which closed indoor dining and other activities. So uh, our projections um, show, unfortunately, that despite our bending down the curve, that hospitalization and ICU demand is, con is projected to continue to remain high over the next month. And so um, before we um, relax measures, um, before we can start to think about relaxing measures, we really will have to wait to have a more substantial vaccination campaign, which should be um, reached around June. So we talk about those projections and um, uh, potential additional measures that can be taken at the end of this talk. So let me just share you with you different modeling perspectives. This um, slide is from um, Jens von Bergman, who has um, helped us see as the province has made different shifts in closing and then opening um, society up and opening and um, restricting and unrestricting. Those are the um, dash lines, how uh, the disease has responded to these measures. And so it really does show that when we, when we change these measures, that's when we can turn um, the case numbers around. And we've seen that with the March 30th restrictions. And of course, there's a delay because you had individuals infected before that time, but then you see this dramatic decline. So this is the concerning rise that we saw at the end of um, with, um, in February and March as the number of, as a proportion of VOCs in the province skyrocketed. And now um, BC's bent down this curve. As you can see, so Jens has broken this apart from the total number of cases in the province, as well as the proportion that are expected to be due to variants of concern. We can't distinguish whether it's B117 or P1 because that data hasn't been provided, but just we're, um, um, grouping together both of those known variants of concern. And the non-variants are really plummeting. They were not growing at the end of March and they've just since are projected to have really declined in numbers. And so really this growth is a growth in the number of variants. 
this is a, a smooth version of the previous graph and it really helps emphasize this point that the dramatic growth seen um, through February and March was in the variants. And um, while the non-variants of previous wild type COVID has, um, is, has um, held steady and then more recently declined after our newest set of restrictions. You can see here too that while the, the total number has declined dramatically, um, the number of VOC cases is roughly constant over this last period. So we're not going to continue to see these this really steep decline, which is due mainly to the decline in this um, the previous variant that we were previous type of COVID that we were dealing with, the less transmittable one. Here we see some model projections by Dr. Dean Carlin of University of Victoria. In this model, that he fits a disease epidemic model that includes the um, infectiousness period of the disease as well as the risk of um, severe cases landing in hospital or in ICU. The dots show the daily or in large dots um, weekly data um, for the pandemic here in British Columbia. And the model allows breakpoints to be fit. Um, and chosen kind of arbitrarily by the model to determine when there are shifts in disease. And of course, there's a little bit of lag between when these shifts happen and when the cases actually turn around because these individuals are infected before this period of time. And so we find as we um, uh, know the restrictions at the end of March, so this model finds that data point, that break, um, and predicts declines in the number of cases. Nevertheless, you can say, see that the declines remain really high now that the variant is dominating the pandemic. So we'll see um, some declines as the vaccines roll out, but um, still continuing high throughout May. Um, and that is also true in the hospitals and ICU projections. So still substantial demand on our um, on the, our medical system through the province. The same picture is seen in most of the health authorities. I'll just flag this picture here, where the Fraser Health Authority shows less of a decline um, and uh, a decent chance that we'll see actual increases, further increases in cases as the variant comes, has dominate, comes to dominate case numbers in the province. Dr. Colleen and her um, uh, associates have um, used kind of different uh, modeling approach to project um, cases over time. You might recognize these graphs and they're used, they underlay BC's um, own modeling approach as well as uh, that presented in the Globe and Mail. And her projections, their projections moving forward, uh, again, show um, a kind of steady number of cases over the next little while, declining as we get into June and July um, as the vaccine um, rollout happens. And, um, this yellow curve helps us see that we can't, we won't be able to relax much um, because we'll continue to see cases growing throughout throughout May if we were to relax relative to our current levels. So the, vaccine, the, the dips that we see, the kind of bending down in, in June that we see is really due to um, uh, the vaccination campaign rolling out and starting to really make a dent in the uh, number of people that are susceptible and prone to getting COVID. Here is a picture of where we are and we'll update this regularly showing our, our target is to get us all vaccinated. You can get a jab in every arm in British Columbia and where we are by age. And uh, what we, um, we don't have finer data, finer resolution in this age group, but at least it gives us an overall picture of where we are. So this is on average, how many vaccinations were at 25% now. And this, um, oh no, even higher, sorry. And that was on um, the 17th, 28th, we've made it to here. And we also are showing you what um, the average level of vaccination is in the UK and Israel, because they rolled out their vaccination campaigns very quickly that they show us what we might be looking ahead to, to see. After um, uh, substantial levels of vaccination, they've seen declines in cases and have started to relax, not hugely, but they've started to reopen slowly. And so 
the types of transitions that they underwent is what we might be looking forward to as we pass through these higher levels of vaccination. Uh, this is another picture uh, projecting how the vaccination campaign is going to roll out to vaccinate um, BC by age. And this is based on the age-based rollout. And the black is the overall number of vaccinations that have been completed. And this, is, this was used in our last report to project how the number of cases would grow over time. And this is just looking at the variants because those were at the time projected to be the vast majority of cases um, uh, soon. As, we, as I said earlier, um, about 90% of cases are now via variants. Anyway, the, at that time, we knew that the province had just rolled out a new restriction, closed restaurants, and that we did not know how much that would bend down the curve. So we projected these um, case numbers with um, nothing changing and with those restrictions reducing our activity levels or transmission risks by 20%, 30%, and 40%. And I, onto those projections, I've just shown what the data look like for the month of April. And this allows us to see that we have nowhere near the case numbers we would have expected had we not been down the curve. So we definitely have bent down the curve. And the data is more consistent with having bent down the curve by somewhere between 30 and 40%, closer to 30%. Again, um, that is what has really made the difference in April um, and kept our case numbers from skyrocketing. And while that is that is um, great news that we've done that, I would uh, the next picture helps see that um, all we're not out of the woods on this one. Um, that if this is the right picture, the hospitalizations, this is hospitalizations due to VOC is actually not projected to decline. And even if we're in this picture um, and we have actually reduced it a little bit better, projected to um, stay roughly the same. So the hospital and ICU demand is still predicted to be very high in the months of May and June. And that leads us, uh, and I should also add that this is an across province picture. And if we um, focused in on regions like the Fraser Health, it would be even more of um, uh, more demand seen there. So based on all of these data, we're kind of drawing a similar picture that we're not gonna be able to substantially ease up in May. The hospitalization and ICU demand is projected to continue to remain high. And that should um, um, really warn us about relaxing um, uh, much and, uh, until um, uh, June. And then this picture, what I was trying to capture is what if we went back to February or March of this year and those activity levels? So not pre-pandemic, but just um, a previous level of activity. And I asked, when would the disease not be able to grow? When would these variants not take off? And it really isn't until end of June that we see that um, we've vaccinated enough of the population to ensure that the disease can't take off. And we buy ourselves a little bit um, more buffer if we vaccinate youth as well as adults. And so hopefully by summer, the, uh, we'll have approval of the vaccines for um, children and, um, to protect them as well as to, to increase the level of vaccination across the province because every person that is vaccinated reduces the ability of this virus to transmit and spread in our communities. So just to wrap up a few final messages. The demand on hospitals and ICUs is predicted to remain high over the next month, meaning that we're unlikely to be able to reopen in February, reopen um, very much, even just to February, March, 2021 levels of activity until June. To reopen more then or to reopen earlier, it's gonna require additional measures. And some additional measures that BC could take include rolling out more rapid testing to isolate, identify and isolate those individuals that don't have any symptoms. Uh, many individuals are have totally asymptomatic um, diseases or transmit before they um, first get symptoms. So if we can, if we can identify them, that can help you um, from spreading the disease when you didn't, didn't even know you were sick. We can also target vaccinations, continue to do this targeted vaccination where there are the most hotspots. That really helps bring down the number of cases by kind of providing a halo around those communities and protecting them better. 
of course, continuing our efforts to increase ventilation, get out more, spend our time outdoors, open windows, um, and um, install and improve ventilation systems wherever we can. And finally, there are combined approaches like using our regular contact tracing, but then adding the possibility of providing really quick rapid testing to those contacts so that they know earlier on whether or not they're carrying COVID and not just monitoring for symptoms. And finally, before I close, what we can do as modelers uh, really depends on the data that are available. And there are quite a few gaps, questions that we'd like to address that we can't really yet because the data don't aren't um, in the public domain. It's really important that we address which communities are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and which ones have or don't have access to um, easy vaccination availability. And so we'd like more data on just this, the, which communities have um, vaccine rollouts. And um, that's one thing we would like to address. Another one is really, we don't still don't know how many people in BC have been infected in the past. And that model matters for our model projections because past infections give people a certain amount of immunity as well. So that would be important information to share. I already mentioned that we don't know exactly how the different variants are doing in the province. Is it is P1 now dominating in more of the health authorities? Uh, and we really can't um, tell um, without more data on the variants of concern. And that matters because they have slightly different mutations in them and slightly different properties. For example, P1 is known to evade um, antibodies and immune systems a little bit more than B117 or the non-variants. We need to know more data on hospital and ICU um, uh, cases by VOC to really estimate the impact of these new variants on our hospital demand. And also to keep an eye on new diseases like B1617 from India, we need to have access to the genetic data themselves. Globally, there's now 1.3 million genomes for SARS-CoV-2 that have been shared worldwide. But here in BC, we're seeing a major lag and uh, there've been only 11 genomic sequences of the virus uploaded to this global um, resource since uh, for cases in 2021. Um, and we know that there have been um, over 10,000 genome sequenced in this time. So this is how we would learn about the spread of different variants like B1617 currently spreading so rapidly in India. So our predictions, our predictions are made less accurate by these data gaps. Um, and more over the, I think that the, a, a more open sharing data policy will help not just us, but the whole community chip in to um, come up with a better, more robust picture of where this pandemic is going and what we can do about it. Thank you.